before I'm leaving the Soviet Union. Freedom for me, it's not reality. Communist regime, socialistic realism called stupid, not interesting, boring art. Abstract art, dangerous for communist regime ideology. Because abstract art, you think it what you want. I'm enemy of humanity. Now I'm criminal for for what? I'm living for freedom, for be freedom artist. Make it art in a freedom society. That's point. I'm coming not for exactly materialistic way. Nice clothes, girls, God. No, trash. At, at for me, not important. Freedom art. Who's this guy? The vibe somewhere between a local fisherman and a Ukrainian Saint Nick? That's Val Polyanin, sculptor, painter, a fixture in the local art scene for the past 30 years. His work has been featured in galleries in Northern California, but locals were most familiar with the humanoid and abstract sculptures that lined the highway south of Crescent City, where Val worked out of four storage containers for 20 years. This surreal roadside attraction was a kind of gateway to the community. And for locals traveling north on the Redwood Highway, the crowd of twisted figures and giant bald heads meant the end of a journey. It meant you were home. For Val, his art also represents a culmination, a journey's end. But Val's destination was freedom. Before I'm living in the Soviet Union, freedom for me, it's not reality. I know freedom, uh, you're doing what you want. You have your freedom for speech, manifestation, religion, art. I'm guaranteed 100% now for everybody, for even for, the, for everybody, art in the United States, 100%. And it's a point why I'm here. Val's journey to freedom began before he was born, with his grandfather in the Ukraine, a locally known outspoken public figure who came to the notice of the NKVD. 1937, uh, night time, knock, 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 knock on the door, you're arrested. For why? You know for why. Val's grandfather spent the next 15 years in the Gulag, imprisoned for his outspoken political views. Fast forward to 1953, Joseph Stalin has just died, and Val Polyanin is born in Ukraine. In school as a young boy, Val becomes interested in art and has fun creating it. But as he grows older, he starts thinking about what happens to people like his grandfather, people who express themselves freely. By the time he is a young man and a practicing artist, Val has already learned to self-censor. First, I'm never talking, never, never talking my future, what I needed. I'm an artist, I'm a normal guy, painting. I'm stuck painting what me want. Uh, exactly what we want to last on maybe five years because uh, people watching. Only be quiet, you do doing what you want. And so thanks for my uh, Gnepa experience. In the Soviet Union of the 1960s, as Val Polyanin was coming of age, artists were stuck between the hammer and the sickle. Socialist realism was the order of the day. And if you weren't making it, you were writing yourself a one-way ticket to the gulag. Or worse. So socialist realism basically um, is the state approved way of um, creating art in uh, under the Soviet Union. And that really started in about the early 20s. This is Jillian Morrison, lead research consultant on the safekeeping exhibition in Crescent City, explaining the aesthetic of socialist realism and just how pervasive its influence was. It needed to focus on the friendship of the people is like a really sanitized way of putting it. Um, But it had to any cultural work. So we're talking movies, we're talking about paintings, drawings, music, poetry, any form of cultural work had to focus on this 
this ideal um, utopia, like socialist utopia, basically. Val's opinion of socialist realism is a bit more colorful. Communist regime, socialistic realism called real propaganda page. Walker, big mallet, why not? Walker, excellent worker, even mallet or lady from village, something help for cow or milking or something. Look like that. Stupid, not interesting, boring art. Not towing the aesthetic party line could be more than just a poor career move. It could be lethal. In 1964, Ukrainian artist Ala Horska, along with a number of other artists, created a subversive work in stained glass called Shevchenko, Mother. The work, which showed Tara Shevchenko, Ukraine's major poet, as an indignant artist hugging a woman who was seen as a symbol of Mother Ukraine. Above the composition was a quote from Shevchenko. I will glorify those voiceless slaves. I will put a word on guard around them. At the behest of party officials, Horska's piece was destroyed with a hammer. And Horska herself, after a career of artistic and political dissent, was allegedly murdered by the KGB a few years later. Coincidentally, also with a hammer. As a young artist, Val already knew he wasn't free to paint just anything he wanted. But he first experienced external censorship in college. A couple of times I make it interesting uh, opinion from my teacher. Uh, my teacher came and we said, Val, take it out. Take it out, no show, no show nobody. About this time, Val had a chance encounter with an artist friend that changed his life. Val's friend had been sentenced to five years in prison for political dissent. When that failed to silence him, he was then sent to a psychiatric facility for treatment. Before I know him, strong, optimistic guy. We see him later. Uh, you know, Zambi? Yeah. All slow, you know? Watch and slow, walk and slow. Said, what you happened for me? Watching for me. Voice, I know, cool. I said, well, we're friends. Oh, well, I remember. Uh, tears coming. This encounter drove home the reality of Val's predicament as an artist in the Soviet Union, and more importantly, it helped solidify his plans to leave by offering him a chilling vision. Life is over. Look at them, you know, no working, no painting. My future. I'm watching if I hear him. Fear. Hey, Glenn, he coming up to now. Oh, it's my future. Val started thinking seriously about trying to flee the Soviet Union after a party at which he'd met a merchant marine who bragged about his international travels. Val had a brilliant idea that hit him like a punch in the face. <gasps> Damn, it's an idea. <laughs> it's an idea, Japan. Japan, uh, not friend, friend with Russia. That's Val found a job with a shipping company sailing out of Vladivostok. After six months, he found himself on a cargo ship sailing through the Sugaru Channel, between the Japanese islands of Honshu and Hokkaido. At just the right moment, when the lookouts the ship's captain had posted were occupied, Val jumped. Yeah, I am jamming. Swimming, swimming, finally. Uh, lots of Japanese people fishing. Fishing some sort. This time, fish on a uh, sweet. Okay, sweet fish on. I see bold, beautiful white girl, blue black angel. After three hours in the water, Val is pulled onto a Japanese fishing boat, offered a blanket and a cigarette. It's then that his new reality hits him. I'll take it down. Escape. Oh, no. oh yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> Back on dry land, despite the language barrier, Val is able to communicate to the Japanese authorities one simple idea. I'll later and say, I'm America, America, America. Ah, the stamp of John for America. Easy. After several months in Japanese immigration centers, Val was granted asylum in the U.S. and given a plane ticket to Los Angeles. He arrived with no money, no possessions. He found work as a dishwasher, then in a cabinet shop where he started using found materials to once again create art. But L.A. wasn't for Val. After visiting a friend in Crescent City in 1992, Val decided to head north. It was about this time that Val learned that the art he'd left behind in the Ukraine, more than 300 individual pieces, had been confiscated by the government. Confiscated by 
Because uh, I am enemy of humanity. Now I'm criminal for for what? But just as the Soviet Union was actively engaged in erasing Val and his art from his homeland, Val was outlining a new life, personally and artistically, in his adopted home, eventually finding space to create in a shipping container by the side of the highway. Thus was born the surreal roadside attraction that became a Crescent City landmark. Then in 2022, Val got some unexpected news from his landlord. He was being evicted from his shop. I am completely crisis as maybe a, a for a strong uh, crisis after my escape. Yeah. Seven years old, out of money, done out of art to go in and live it in the street. You know what's needed? There's no life of order. Forced to find a home for both himself and his art. Val did something extreme. He left a note for his landlord, suggesting that maybe the art should be given to the city. He jumped off the ship, swam to shore, and found asylum with the United States. He had papers signed by Ronald Reagan, so he had said. And um, he has since migrated to Crescent City, spent his life making art here, and um, really being a community member here at Crescent City. Despite some debate about the cost and the appropriateness of the city footing that bill, in June of 2022, the Crescent City Council voted to accept Val Pollyannon's art. Seeing no public comment, clerk, please hold vote. Council Member Altman? Yes. Council Member Inscore? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Mayor Pro Chen Wright? Yes. Mayor Green? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I look forward to having more discussions on this and uh, please let me know when you're going to be moving. I would love to be there to help. So um, John and myself and uh, Bridget Lacey all went down to the Connex boxes and t took a look at what art was there and really what, um, how much work we were looking at. And I think all of us were just really kind of blown away by the amount of work that was there. Um, I, don't, I can't speak for anyone else, but for me, um, I was right then and there, I was sure we needed to do something with it. Like we weren't going to just let that um, go to waste. Because um, the impression that we were under at the time was that if we didn't take on the work, then it was going to be disposed of, basically. With the looming threat of destruction, the city started cataloging the more than 900 pieces of art and searching for a home for the collection. Coincidentally, the city happened to have a very safe place to keep the collection, the old Bank of America building, which is slated to become the new city hall. For me, the, the space was an important part of the project. Um, when the thought of this art being destroyed came up, in you know, just the fact that we had this safe place, you know, that was a bank, it all just made sense. And considering what was going on in Ukraine at the time, um, it seemed like the perfect fit. Creating a gallery space isn't usually the domain of city government, and with only a handful of volunteers to do it, the project was all the more challenging. Thankfully, there was someone they could call who knew a thing or two about creating these spaces. Annalise Flynn works as a curator for the Spaces Archive, which had featured Val's work on its website while he was still by the side of the highway. Annalise was contacted by then-Public Works Director John Olson early on in the project for advice on how best to save Val's art. Of course, a challenge with that is that this is not a traditional art space, and so it wasn't necessarily set up um, to display artwork or an exhibition in the way that people may have anticipated, um, having been to galleries or having been to museums. Um, but I think, you know, what we tried to do was just make sure that this was framed as um, a non-traditional space for a non-traditional artist. Um, one thing that you see with uh, many artists who create art environments is a strong sense of resourcefulness, of just using whatever materials and places are available to them. And so I felt like showing the artwork in this existing building um, was such a great idea that was totally in line with the kind of work that Val does, you know, in the same spirit. In the same sense that Val used what he had at hand to create his art, the city also had to be creative and transform an old bank into a new gallery space. But even if the art stays in Crescent City, it can't stay in this space forever. Yeah, that's definitely 
a challenge because we couldn't, we had to always consider that this would be temporary. Um, so, you know, no fancy lighting, no, um, nothing really permanent. Um, so that was definitely something to work around, but I think it also helped add to the, the project to have this feel like people viewing it would only get to see it this one time and have that make it feel a little bit more special. With the work complete, the space was ready for the public. A wave of community support came through the doors on opening night. I love it. It's amazing. What's not to love about it, right? What I think about it is that there's so many facets to it. That we've got the dark, we've got the mysterious, we have the fun, and sometimes, like this, it's a little twisted. It's a little twisted. The art itself is incredible. All of the mixed media. It's something that Del Norte County has never really seen before, so it's a very unique opportunity for us. This is amazing, amazing to me. I knew how much, how great his artwork was, but I had no idea really now that I'm looking at it properly displayed. And what a gift to Crescent City I think it is. I think it's something that I hope that we can help install in its proper place in the American art scene because I think it's a, a golden opportunity and to know that every once in a while I get to talk to Val and all of this has come out of his head, it's to totally amazing to me. You know, my first impression coming in today was that we had an opportunity to really see maybe in a, in a, in a way that you can't tell when, when it's all just stacked, you know, when it's just leaning against each other. And I, I remember when I first saw some of the art um, out in the shipping containers and you look at something, you go, oh, that's kind of cool. But to come in today and to see it displayed, to see people here enjoying it, um, I, I just don't think I could have imagined that it could have turned out any better. I'm impressed that it's happening at all. Yeah. You know, for a small town, this is huge. We, yeah. are, we support public art yeah. in any uh, yeah. venue, and this is just fantastic. Yeah. All the different mediums used, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Different culture, and I enjoy that, you know, because we're so isolated up here. We just don't get that, you know, we have Native American or Hmong, some Hispanic, but that's about it up here. It's very so It's diverse. nice to see something else. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. I mean, it was not what I expected. I didn't, I thought, this was going to be such a push to get the community to get behind because I, I thought it it was too different and something kind of too outside of the box for the, the community and to see them embrace it was unexpected but super exciting. For the summer of 2023, during each First Friday event, the public can enjoy the art of Val Pollyannon being exhibited in the Bank of America building in Crescent City. After that, well, what happens with the over 900 pieces of art has yet to be determined but one thing is certain, for now, the art of Val Pollyannon is being kept safe at home in Crescent City. And Val, he's still here too, and he's still making art. Ah, I'm addicted. No, not addicted. Oh, I'm maybe addicted. As a principle, my life, only art makes me happy. Money for me, nothing. Life's simple now. <laughs> For me, after uh, save guys, save my my art. Now for me, guy coming my last chapter of my life. A happy chapter, not sadness. See, if you, it's my future. It's exhibition. People like it and watching. That's it. I don't need that money. I don't need it. Bravo, clapping. No, people coming and watching. It's a triumph. For all artists, it's a triumph, peak of life here. I'm not joking, it's a reality. Thanks, Uncle Sam. <laughs>